But my name's Lewis Goodwin. How do I know? My wife sends me out with my name on just to make sure I don't get lost. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Second World War. And at the age of 16, everyone during the wartime had to do something. They had to take part in some war activity. If they're too, old, too young or too old to go into the services, they were expected to do something at home. So I joined the local fire watching group and I and another person had to walk around the village every Friday night, several times during the night, to make sure the Germans were not dropping incendiary bombs on us because they were coming over and bombing Sheffield. And uh, my only benefit on that on a Friday night was the fact that my neighbour was the baker in the local bakehouse. At three o'clock in the morning we used to go into the bakehouse and get the first bread rolls out. And then when I was 17, I joined the Home Guard. But in, in 1943, when I was 18, I got my calling up papers to go in the army. And most people in Lincoln, or the Lincoln area, just went up to the barracks in Newport here. I had to go up to Glasgow, 350 miles away from home, and I'd never been away from home before. And uh, I had to travel on three trains and one bus from seven o'clock on the one night until six o'clock the following morning. And I had to stand up on all the trains all the way up to Vasco. And I duly reported to the Harvard Light Infantry Barracks. And there I did six weeks basic training. You were shown into your barrack room. And at six o'clock next morning, the door would burst open. The sergeant or the corporal would come in and shout, wakey, wakey, one minute to get out of bed. How many of you take more than one minute to get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. And you had to be out in one minute. And we're down to the ablutions to get washed and shaved. Cold water, no hot water, breakfast at seven, on the barrack square at eight, and there we stayed until six o'clock at night, training, physical training, marching, rifle practice, running. <clears throat> that was to teach us discipline. Then I got my posting, along with everyone else, and I was told I was going to Catrick Camp in Yorkshire to join the Royal Corps of Signals. This is the communications side of the services. I was taught all methods of communicating, including line communication and radio. And when we wore a radio, the radio was about that big by that big, and it weighed the equivalent of 14 two pounds bags of sugar. And it used to be strapped to your back. And you could, you could broadcast about half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Got that thing now and I can talk to Australia, can't I? As easy as anything. So when I had finished 18 weeks of intensive training on communications where I had to learn the Morse code, I had to learn how to operate a teleprinter, how to operate a radio, I got my posting along with eight others and they said you are going to join HMS Dundonald. Anyway, we do the found a way over to HMS Dundonald, which was a camp on the River Clyde, <coughs> and we found that it was split into three camps. Dundonald 1 was all naval personnel, Dundonald 2 was all army personnel, and Dundonald 3 was all air force personnel. And during the weeks we were there, we were told that you are now going to fight as one unit, all three services together, you are now in combined operations. And while we were there, we had to do lots of assaults on the Isle of Arran, six o'clock in the morning on a landing craft and paddling out in cold water in January and February. It wasn't very pleasant. And then I got my post in, along with two others, said, right, you are now going to join a Royal Naval ship. And that was the ship I was posted to. Who can read the name of the ship when it says HMS? Largs, right. HMS Largs started life in 1938. She was built in Saint-Nazaire by the French as a passenger carrying banana boat. 
carrying passengers and fruit from Jamaica to France. In 1939, when war was declared, the French government requisitioned it and put guns on and turned her into an armed gunboat to stop other ships at sea searching for contraband. But in 1940, the French surrendered the whole of their navy, including their ship, she was called Charles Plumier then, to the Germans in the North African port of Iran. And the Germans made the French crew sail around to Dakar in North Africa, where she was refitted with German diesel engines to fight against us for the rest of the war. But what the Germans didn't know, but what our naval intelligence knew, they knew the date the refit had been completed, they knew the date she was going to sail out of Dakar, and they knew where she was going to sail to. So when she went out to sea, three of our destroyers arrested her, put an armed guard on her, and they eventually made the crew sail her back to England. In late 41 and early 42, she had two million pounds worth of equipped communications equipment built onto her. She was sailed into a little town of Largs, and she was rechristened HMS Largs with a bottle of rum. And then I joined that ship, and I sailed about 50,000 miles on that ship during the Second World War. Just to show you that there's an army section on board, who's going to look at that and find out where I am on the picture? But I am sitting there, right in the front row. And I don't look any older than I was then, do I? We're still cracking bubbly for the boys who freed us. That girl was four years old on D-Day morning. They'd been under German occupation for four years in France when we went and invaded on D-Day. And they were all hiding down in the cellar because there was all bombing and all sorts of noise going on. The noise of war is terrible. And uh, it, our airborne troops landed just near that house just after midnight on the morning of D-Day and two of our paratroopers went and hammered on the door. The father went to the door thinking it was still the Germans there, most surprised to see two airborne troops and he realised that they had been freed from occupation after four years and this was their first breath of freedom. And that little girl was then four years old. And during the afternoon of D-Day, the captain in the oxen box gave her his bar of chocolate, and it was the first chocolate she had tasted in four years. I bet you had lots of chocolate before you were four years old, didn't you? And that lady was so impressed, and Pegasus Bridge Cafe had been the first house to be relieved in France. She immediately, when she grew up, dedicated it to the Normandy veterans. Well, I'm on. From that house, we are entitled to go back there any time we like. And that lady now is a personal friend of mine. And just to show you what, what she looks like now, that's, her, that's the lady. And she's a personal friend of mine. And she's never, ever forgotten that morning of D-Day. <laughs>